So coming up next, who do we have? We have April Edwards. And April Edwards, you know what? Uh, I am so thankful that you're here today. You are one of my teammates. We're on the same team together. We get to spend a lot of time uh, learning about DevOps and and really selling uh, how important it is. So how are you today? I'm doing great, Jay. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm so glad to be here. This is great. You know, I'm I'm doing well. Um, let, let's take a look at what you're going to be talking about today really quick. I know we've got uh, a quick description that we're going to be implementing an automated process that uh, leads to DevOps success. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, give you a chance to, to talk about automation on Azure. Um, I think that You've got a lot of great information for us today, and I'm going to kind of let you take the lead. Now, I'll, I'll see where we go and maybe ask some questions along the way. Sounds good. So we're going to talk about automation on Azure. And Martin Woodward just said it, you know, pick something that hurts and start there. And before we start, we're going to talk about, you know, why automation is important and what we can do to automate. So, you know, we define what DevOps is, right? And, you know, it is it is the combination of people, process and products and that technology thing to deliver this value. And we want to deliver value. You know, we want to bring people together and we want to have common shared goals. And that's really important. And we need to increase the collaboration. And, and, you know, when you have different backgrounds in an organization, that can be really tough to do. You know, Martin has that developer background and um, Stephen has that operational background and same with you and I, like we have very Mm -hmm. different backgrounds, right? So we work together, you and I, you know, in our organizations to execute these things. And technology is a big part of that, but it's it's driving that value of whatever we're doing. But we need to be able to enable our teams to do more and be more effective. And we need to facilitate experimentation in our organizations. And that's crucial. And we need to focus on automation. And, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a hard thing knowing where to start, but we go, well, well, why is this important? Because, you know, I'm an operational person. I don't want to change, but we need to make these changes because your competition's already doing it. And, you know, forget everything else, forget all the stats about, you know, increased velocity and all these things. Those are really important, but human error. A lot of the outages that you and I have seen and probably created ourselves has been down to our own error. So I want to talk about the people side of it a little bit. You know, people is the hardest part of DevOps. We're asking people to make a cultural change. Now, when you have an ops team and a development team and any other teams in an organization and they're trying to make changes, traditionally, we worked in silos and we blame that other side of the team. And that's difficult because, you know, we we need to be able to work effectively. But what we found is the other side and we just toss things over the fence to each other. And that doesn't go well. That's not driving the same value together. So we need to look at, okay, our process a little bit. Um, you know, we have kind of four phases in our process. And, and when Martin and, and Stephen and yourself are talking about DevOps, this is crucial because we want to continuously reiterate our process. Now, and that starts with the planning phase. We want to do everything early and often, and we want to fail fast. So when we talk about automation, if it doesn't work, we need to find something that works better or another way to do things. And when we're in that planning phase, we need to look at some of the tooling, whether we're using something like Azure boards or GitHub issues, et cetera, and plan what our work's going to be. We need to then develop our work, whether you're in operations or a developer, yes, operations, you need to do some development network. And when we start talking about some things we're going to talk about in a minute, you'll understand why. And you may use tooling like Visual Studio, um, Visual Studio Code or GitHub Code Spaces, whatever your tool of choice is to develop. And then we deliver that code. And then we want to operationalize whatever it is we're delivering. And that's crucial to have this full cycle. So when Martin and Steven were talking about the process and we talk about DevOps and we're going to start automating things, we want everything in this process to be fully automated when and where possible. But if we make one change today, and like Martin said, one change per week, we can start building on top of our process. So I want us to focus on tooling over tasks. Now, Jay, with an operational background, when you were taught to automate something, how did that make you feel? You know what? Automation to me really made me feel like we were taking uh, the manual work out of our hands and really placing it into, uh, in a way, in an, another basket. We were mm-hmm. uh, still working on how to actually create automation. We were testing it, um, making sure that you know, every single time we had notifications that said this deployment has occurred, uh, and it gave me a little bit of safety. Mm-hmm. And I think 
That's awesome. But I think we see a lot of people that are really afraid of automation. And I think we need to let the think of the tooling side of it, where we need to let our machines do the repetitive tasks while our humans are building the tools to solve the problems and we're being more proactive, right? And there's a massive value when we start to automate things. And I'm going to quote one of my favorite humans, Jeffrey Snover. And he said this, and, and this is so true from when I've engaged with operational teams across the world and development teams as well. You know, nothing is more important than automation because productivity equals career security. So when people are in maybe an operational role, we see it a lot where we're afraid to automate something because it takes something out of our hands, out of that control, but then allows us to do something more proactive. And we look at all these issues in our organization. So we have automation to the rescue. So we talked about that process before, and we're going to start looking at how we can automate our builds and do things early and often. So we do building of our code and we start testing our code and then we start deploying it. And you go, well, hold on a second. That's great for developers but I'm in operations. So I wanna talk about infrastructure as code a bit because it is part of DevOps. And when we start talking about this whole process and we start automating these things and are into what we're deploying, we're kind of referring to what we call continuous integration and continuous delivery. And there's lots of tooling out there that can help us. I wanna talk about infrastructure as code because Jay, both you and I love infrastructure as code. It's kind of at the heart and soul of what we do, right? Yes, I, um, and there's so many different options out there nowadays. You know, I, I remember coming into it and, you know, it was pretty much chef and puppet. And those yeah. were your, or, and then there was like CF Engine and things like that that came as well. I worked, I grew up in a PowerShell world. Um, mm -hmm. I say grew up, I mean, in the kind of the automation side of my career, it was all PowerShell for me. That's where I learned automation. I started automating things in Exchange and SharePoint and through Windows Server many, many years ago. Um, and I didn't think of it this way, and it took some time, but infrastructure is code at this point. Um, and when we start looking at tooling like infrastructure as code to start automating the beginning process, and this is great because this is something you can do on premise, uh, you can do it at Azure or multiple cloud. And we start looking at different practices, and this is where the tooling side comes into play, but this is also the people change. And I know, Jay, you and I can attest, we have to change a lot to embrace these processes, right? Mm -hmm. We have to start putting our code in source repos in code source repositories. So maybe we're using GitHub or Azure repos. Um, then we have to start looking at the life cycle of our code. And this has a lot of benefits because we start not just hoard hoarding our code to ourselves and then, you know, something going awry when we go on vacation, but we start collaborating with our teammates. So that breaks down those barriers. So we start collaborating with our other operational folk, our developers, our DBAs, our PMs, whomever else is involved in that project. So we increase our collaboration. Then we start versioning our code. You know, think of it, you know, the old days where we kind of save a file and go, you know, you'd have like file hyphen one and different versions. You'd put it into like your little file server. When we start using, you know, source code repositories, we start using better practices where we version it and we can also have governance around it and we have full traceability. And this means we can also have our code as reproducible and very scalable. And that's what customers want. They don't want to just go deploy a virtual machine and be done with it. So the types of tooling with the infrastructure code is vast and people go, where do we start? There's tons of options. So the first few at the top are cloud native, excuse me, are Azure native. So we have ARM templates, but Jay, you and I have both used, right? Mm-hmm. And in, now there's Bicep. Yeah. And I love Bicep. I was not a fan of ARM, but... You could go into the Azure portal, deploy something, export an ARM template and get started. Like it was a really good Azure native way to get started. Bicep, the overlay on top of ARM is so much easier to learn, so much more readable um, and it's gaining huge amounts of popularity. Um, and then you can do stuff in the Azure CLI and with PowerShell. Um, and now PowerShell is cross-platform. It's just not in Windows anymore, which I think makes it even cooler. And then we have the other tools like Terraform, which is multi-cloud. So again, for those of you working in kind of this hybrid environment, um, you know, whether you're going Azure, AWS, or GCP, we want you to use Azure, but you can use Terraform. You know, you also have tools like Pulumi that allow you to take the code knowledge you already have. You know, maybe you code in C Sharp or Go or TypeScript. Pulumi allows you to do that and then write your tests in code. Um, and then like you mentioned, Jay, like Chef, that's a lot of what we got started with. And you have Puppet and Ansible, again, multi-cloud. Uh, state management of your environment. So this is kind of an end-to-end -end solution where we have this full cycle, where we plan um, in Azure boards as a, you know, an engineer, and I'm using the term engineer to talk about our, our role effectively. Then we write mm -hmm. our code in Visual Studio, Visual Studio code, accessing an Azure repo. We deploy that code to something, and then we wrap around that operational side with some kind of monitoring, like 
Azure Application Insights. Now, if everyone stays tuned for the next talk, we're going to hear from my colleague, Donovan Brown, where he's going to talk about a step further, where he's going to go cloud native and that full life cycle. So before we go any further, I love doing a demo, Jay. So are you ready? I love me a demo. I love me a demo. Why don't you bring it on up? Cool. So I'm going to work in PowerShell because I love working in PowerShell. Um, I've already pre-authenticated into the Azure CLI, but what I've done here is I've told Azure, I want to deploy an Azure static web app. So I want to go full end-to-end, -end, fully automated solution. So instead of going into the portal, we are going to touch the portal, but we're not going to deploy via the portal. We're going to use some you know, very light infrastructure as code. I'm going to connect this into my, I've told my code where my GitHub repo is sitting, uh, what branch, where I want to deploy the static web app to, and the name of my static web app. So if you can see the name at the top, create, uh, DevOps, I'm sorry, that's the resource group. Um, it'll be SWA hyphen create DevOps. Now, when I run this code, it's gonna go connect to my Azure portal. It's already authenticated through with Active Directory and it successfully deployed my static web app. So I'm gonna go over to the Azure portal and in the portal here, I can see in my resource group, I have a new static web app. It's deployed much, much faster than if I do it from the portal. It also outputs a URL for us. Now this URL is randomized. We can put in a custom DNS name. Absolutely, that's fine. But it mm -hmm. spits that out on the creation of our static web app. Now, after it's created the URL, we can click on it and we can see that our static web app is live, but there is nothing running in it. So, okay, we need to put some code in it. If we go back to our portal, we can see that it sees our main branch, it sees our GitHub repository, and it sees the action, and it's creating a workflow. So if I click on this edit workflow, what it's doing is creating a whole workflow for us. Now, this is awesome. So what we have here is a full CI CD pipeline. So that is as soon as I initiate my code, it's going to execute this workflow for us using a GitHub action. So it's that writing all the YAML for us, right? Yes, because when we talk about where do we start, what do we do? Like sometimes it's hard to know where to get started. And that's why I love Azure Static Web Apps, because as we deploy it in, to, in from our GitHub repository, it gives us this YAML file. So we have CI CD out of the box. So in this YAML file, it's going mm -hmm. to say on any push of our code to our main branch, or maybe even a pull request, it's gonna run a couple jobs. It's actually running two jobs. First, it's doing a build and deploy job. It's building our code. It's gonna push that code out to our Azure Static Web App. And you can see here, well, lines 25 and 26, it already kind of encodes our secrets for us. So it doesn't expose anything. It has that security built in automatically. So I don't have to think about it. So I wanna go actually go see this workflow run. So. We didn't have any code into our website. I can see it build and deploy our code. It's still running. It's running through that exact workflow that I just showed you. So that's pretty cool. So now that it's completed successfully, I can go up to our static web app. I can go ahead and refresh the screen. Boom, we have a working website. How cool is that? Wow. that yeah. That's so great. So let me ask you a question about this. Mm -hmm. um, do you think I should keep my infrastructure code the same repository as my application code? So like if I'm creating a bicep template or something like that. So I personally, and you know, this is best practice. Your infrastructure has dependencies on your, uh, your application code most often than not. Right. So they should be in the, in the same repository. They should be in a different file structure such so they're not, maybe not next to each other and they can be easily identified. You can put um, different CI pipelines to them um, and you can cause different triggers, but they should be in the same repository. So you can do dependencies in your workflows and your branching policies. But yes, I've always put my source code next to my infrastructure's code. So in this instance, um, I could have deployed this with an Azure bi bicep file. I could have used ARM. I could have used Terraform. I chose mm -hmm. the Azure CLI just for a bit of visibility, but I could have this even more automated um, down the road. And I'd absolutely put this into another folder within the same repository. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense yeah. because we want to make sure that we are, we're checking in everything. We're, we're looking at everything. We're, we're not giving ourselves multiple pipelines because yeah. we, we can create like say sub modules of a pipeline. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we don't necessarily need to have it in two completely separate pipelines. And, you know, Donovan, who uh, we're, we'll be seeing next, was someone who kind of told me about how this is just a really, really cool thing to do is to think about how you're deploying 
all of your infrastructure, not just bits and pieces and then your application deploy. Absolutely. And that's super critical. And I want to go ahead and show you a little bit of an Easter egg that's built in this static web app. So if I go back to my static web app, I can go into my code. Now, my code is sitting in the same repository. I can create another folder. I am going to change my code on my main branch. Now, when I go into this file here, this is my website file. So, you know, there can be debate on how this is done, but for just ease of display today, I want to go ahead and change this website on the fly. So we've just deployed our website. I'm going to go ahead and put in a welcome to create DevOps, and I'm going to go ahead and commit my code, but I'm not going to commit it to my main branch because that's bad developer practices. I'm going to get a pull request and create a new branch, which I can do within GitHub. I can also do that for my favorite IDE. And when it creates the pull request, it's going to run through our code again, because we have to remember those two triggers we saw in our CICD pipeline are going on pull requests or any change to main. And we can see here with the change to website, it says number 16. Now, number 16 is the number of our pull request. So hang on a minute because that's going to come back to us in a second. And we're going to show how that flows through in the process. So because I've opened this pull request, I've made changes to our code. We can go ahead and build and deploy our code again. It's going to run through that exact same pipeline. Again, this is all out of the box. So it's going to run through our code, do all this cool stuff. So we've created an Azure static web app. We've deployed our code to our web app without having to touch any quote infrastructure. It's all been automated end to end. We could go a little bit further and automate the infrastructure's code piece, but for now, we're going to get the website up. So Very when this cool. actually, yeah. So, but here's an Easter egg. Now, this is a special feature that is built explicitly into GitHub when you deploy an Azure Static Web App. So, thinking of another developer best practice, we don't want to touch production, do we, Jay? No, we want to make sure that we have some sort of um, place to go and stage. Exactly. So in GitHub, we can see here, it creates a staging site when I open this pull request. So it, it, we can see it's here, it's ready. It does this automatically and it's built in feature. So if I click on this link here, it's going to open up our new version of our website. Very cool. So April, we've only got about two minutes left or so. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, we, we've really uh, learned a ton in, in just a short amount of time. Uh, and if people want to be able to reach out to you to talk more about this, right below, you can see that we've got uh, April's Twitter uh, right there so that you can go ahead, reach out to her and ask any additional questions. Uh, we, we've got lots and lots of information also in the chat. Uh, we'll answer your questions. We've got some great ones that have come in. Um, but anything, uh, April, I want to just wrap up by asking you this. Um, how how did you uh, really feel uh, when DevOps first became kind of like a part of what you do? Just in, in like 30 seconds. I had this idea that we could do things better. Like our processes could be improved. And I didn't realize there was a word for it. That, that was how new I was to it. So when I actually learned it was a thing and there were stats and there was like a process and a whole school thought and like hard facts behind it, that really excited me. And that's why I became, I went from an ops side to a developer side in my career. And that's why I became just enthralled with DevOps, how it works and how we can do everything better. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, April.